I love bubbles. But in this video, I don't want to talk about ordinary round bubbles. I want to talk about the kind of crazy bubbles that formed when you take a wireframe like this. This one is a tetrahedron. Tetra means four, so it's got four corners. And the beautiful bubble that it forms has an intersection of four planes that come together into four lines and meet at one single point in the middle. But I can put a bubble into this bubble. And now what I have is a tetrahedron bubble, a four-sided bubble that is on the inside of the tetrahedron wireframe. But does this kind of behavior copy over to, for example, this cube? Well, let's test. When I put the cube in, what we get is not everything coming to a single point. It comes together into a square in the middle. What's fascinating is that right now the square is facing you and I, but if I wiggle to the left and right, now the square faces this way. And if I jiggle up and down a little bit, now the square faces up and down. Each of those configurations is a stable solution. It minimizes the surface area, which is what a bubble is always trying to do. And now I can put a bubble into this bubble. Once again, the bubble on the inside mimics the wireframe on the outside. This is a cube bubble inside of a cube wireframe. I also want to note that for every one of the vertices that you see, whether it's this one with the bubble or I can come along and pop and go back to a square, at every vertex, it's the intersection of precisely four lines. And similarly, each line is the intersection of three planes with an angle of precisely 120 degrees. These laws of bubbles, like that vertices are the intersections of four lines, was conjectured by Joseph Plateau, a physicist in the 19th century. But the mathematical proof that they will always happen for all bubbles was mathematically proven by Gene Taylor in the 1970s using something called geometric measure theory. I'm going to go from a cube. This time I'm going to go to an octahedron. And I love the octahedron. Okay, make your predictions for the octahedron now. Let's see what we have. I have to move it up nice and slowly. And there we get it. It makes this incredible bubble with a tetrahedron right in the middle. But what's actually particularly crazy about the octahedron is that there's not just one possible solution. Like we saw with the cube where there was multiple alternative stable states, there turns out to be five different stable states here for the octahedron. While the version with the tetrahedron center has the lowest possible area among the stable options, this stable configuration has a pentagon in the middle, while this one has a hexagon in the middle. And then there's also two options with quadrilaterals in the center, one being a square, one not being a square. I couldn't seem to make them with the bubbles, but here are the images of what they look like. That said, the way the symmetry works, if I put a bubble in the middle, let's do that now, it creates an octahedron bubble mirroring the octahedron in general. So once again, we have this symmetry between the bubble that's formed on the inside and the overall wireframe. This next one is really instructive. I'm going to start with a square, which just gives a boring bubble. It's a portion of a plane. If I drop a thread into the bubble, well, what do you think will happen when I pop it? Let's see. It snaps into a circle, but why a circle? Well, the thread has a fixed perimeter, and the circle is the shape that encloses the largest possible area for that fixed perimeter. Since Bubbles try to minimize surface area. Removing the largest shape of the circle minimizes the surface area. This is the same principle of why normal three-dimensional bubbles form spheres. They are the smallest surface area for a given volume. We can understand the behavior of bubbles a bit more clearly by focusing on the plane. If I put a single bubble onto the plane, it forms a hemisphere. So on the plane, you just get a circle. If I put two bubbles adjacent to each other on the plane, they form this shape that has a straight line in between them, and then you can measure that the angles formed at the two vertices are once again the same 120 degrees, so evenly dividing up the full 360 degrees into three different portions. It's actually a theorem, the two-bubble theorem, we'll call it, proved in the 90s that for two equal areas, the configuration gives the minimal amount of boundary material needed to contain the two areas. If I add a third bubble, I think we get the clearest picture yet of the 120 degree angle that keeps on happening right there in the middle. Now, it is the three bubble theorem proved in the early 2000s that this is the minimal amount of boundary material needed to contain three equal areas. And amazingly, the quadruple bubble version was 
only proved in 2021 for the plane, and in 22 for dimensions 3, or actually for arbitrary dimension n. What I love even more is putting bubbles in between two parallel planes. Just a single bubble pops up and makes a cylinder, again leveraging the principle that a circle minimizes the perimeter for a fixed area. Now, only it is a volume with extending that circle vertically to get a cylinder. As we add more and more bubbles between the planes, you get this honeycomb-like structure where, once again, it's 120 degree angles everywhere. An actual honeycomb is nearly perfect with this regular pattern of hexagons, and they actually form the minimal amount of surface area needed to contain equal size regions. Bees are great minimizers. Not so great and struggled to make identical volume bubbles, so the polygonal structure you see here isn't perfect hexagons, but they do maintain the 120 degree angle. This is in contrast to other species, like a giraffe's fur is polygonal, but it's not 120 degree angles. Similarly, a dragonfly wing forms polygonal structures once again, but not always 120 degrees. This is because they are made out of rigid structures that grow as the animals grow, kind of like a crystal forming in a petri dish. And the rigidity means that things don't move around to optimize those angles. These are called Voronoi cells, and I did a separate video on those. But if we look at bubbles, those edges do move around as they always try to minimize and so always get to that 120 degrees. This one is one of my favorite examples to illustrate how when you have the same wireframe, you can still get very different shaped bubbles. Notice that for these bottom circles, I can take the pencil right through it, but for the top circles, the plates are entirely filled in. But now I'm going to make the bubble in a different way. I'm going to come along and I'm going to squeeze and then I'm going to pull it out. And notice it's exactly the opposite. Now it's these plates that are full, and this is the one where I can take my pencil and stick it through. It's inverted which of these circles are the ones that are filled in, and which is the one that's got the hole. So you might think, okay, there's two circles, two possibilities. Let me show you a third possibility. I'm gonna squeeze everything together as I make this one. And when I pull it out, I get these two different discs, but I can pop them. I'm gonna pop this disc here, that lets me put my pencil through that way. I'm gonna pop this disc here, and it lets me pop it that way. Now I can go through both of the different discs, and look at that, there's this weird bubble that forms in the middle. So the same wireframe has now allowed three different stable solutions to be formed. Now every bubble has an inside and an outside, a top and a bottom, right? Right? Well, check out this one. Maybe you'll be able to see where I'm going with this. I pull it out, and again, I can try and pop this portion, which is in the middle, and I'm, I get a bubble that's left over, but watch what happens. I'm gonna start on the outside, clearly on the outside. Wrapping around, wrapping around, wrapping around, wrapping around, wrapping around, now I'm on the inside. This is called a Mobius strip bubble, and it's a one-sided bubble. All right, what else do we got here? Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, this is just a helix. If I dip a helix in, the shape that you get is referred to as a helicoid. This is one of the other early minimal surfaces that was discovered mathematically. You can write down the exact equations for this particular surface. Knowing the equations, we can animate how the helicoid surface changes as we stretch or compress the helix like it was a spring. Sometimes the equations do funkier things than you might imagine. Like, this one is, well, it's a pretty bubble, but nothing particularly special. It looks like a, a circle that I've kind of gone and bent. But if you write down the equations for this surface, it's called Eniper's surface, you can extend those equations beyond the boundary and you get this crazy self-intercepting surface, a surface I couldn't make with a bubble solution, but I can use the mathematics that works for this particular one and extend it beyond it, getting this incredible surface. Let me show a few of my other favorites here. This one is two rings. If I dip those in, the rings just form discs. Kind of boring. If I put them together and then pop the central hole that forms, I get this cool tunnel. But the question is, what exactly is the curve that makes the shape of this tunnel? Now, it turns out that you can answer this using something called the calculus of variations. And I've done a whole video actually explaining the mathematics. So if you're a, if you're a student who's seen a bit of calculus, you can check out that video to, to see exactly what the shape of this curve is. We'd seen what happened with two disconnected loops. What if we come along and take those two circles and connect them like this? This is called the Hopf link. 
And when I put it in, initially you get a little region. There's some lines that are appearing in the middle, but let's see if, my, if I can pop it. You get this really cool connection. These are sometimes known as Seifert surfaces. And when you study knots and links between them, you often are interested in trying to study the surfaces that the boundaries create. I've done videos before on knot theory, I'll link them down below. And often in mathematics, there's an intimate connection between the boundary and the surface, and you can study one or the other to understand the other one. These beautiful bubbles just go to show that math comes up all over in our world. And if you want to get better at math, then I strongly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is brilliant.org. Brilliant has thousands of lessons in math, science, and computer science, and what I really appreciate about them is just how interactive they are. You get to play with the animations, you get to try out the activities that help you self-assess your understanding, and if you get stuck, Brilliant helps you figure it out. Brilliant designs their lessons to break down the big ideas into digestible chunks, building up complexity in layers. So by the time we've built up to, say, a neural network that predicts what shape you've drawn, you've understood every step along the way of how that neural network is built. Working regularly, day by day, on your math skills, especially when supported by a learning platform that puts you in the driver's seat, can make a big difference over time, and that's why I am so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. To try everything that Brilliant has for free, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett or click the link down in the description to get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said and done, comment below which of all of these different bubbles you thought was the coolest, and regardless, we'll do some more math in the next video.